the year was 1999 and the world was all set to welcome the new millennium. But unfortunately for India, it turned out to be a disastrous week. On the 24th of December 1999, Indian Airlines flight IC814 was hijacked by Pakistani terrorists. The hijackers took the hijacked aircraft across four countries and the then Indian government under Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee allegedly mishandled the entire crisis situation. Eventually, India bowed down to the demand of the hijackers and as a result, India paid a heavy price as far as its security was concerned. In fact, even till date, the impact of this event affects India's security situation. Welcome to the fourth episode of India's biggest foreign policy controversies. This discussion is part of a new limited series that has been going on through this week live on our YouTube channel. So today we shall analyze how Vajpayee mishandled the Kandahar hijack situation. So please take a look at the schedule of these classes which is being held live on our YouTube channel at 7 p.m. So do join the last session as well this Saturday on 6th of April for a very interesting topic which is relevant in contemporary times. If you guys are liking the new initiative, do let us know in the comments. If you want us to start more such exciting series, we want you to comment as to what topics you would like us to cover. And if you are benefiting from the initiatives, do press the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's begin with today's discussion and understand how this topic is relevant for UPSC civil services examination. See, through this topic, we can understand a number of issues that are related to international relations and also internal security. Both are very important subjects under GS Paper 2 and GS Paper 3. So in today's discussion, we will not just focus on this particular event, but we will dive deep into the topic and carry out a critical assessment. First, we'll try to examine how exactly the Indian government mishandled the situation, what was the criticism, and are there any counter arguments in defense of Prime Minister Vajpayee. We will make it a balanced debate, keep it politically unbiased, and look at both sides of the argument. Then we will also discuss other related issues, such as Pakistan's sustained sponsorship of terrorism against India, which was responsible for this hijacking. We will also discuss the usage of Nepal as a safe haven for terrorist outfits by Pakistan's intelligence agency, the ISI. We will also be talking about the challenges India faced with the Taliban regime in Afghanistan because the hijacked plane eventually landed in Kandahar and Taliban surrounded the hijacked aircraft and India had to mediate with the hijackers through the Taliban mediators. So we had a very complicated relationship with the Taliban back then in 1999. So it's important to examine that angle as well. We will also discuss the impact, the consequences of India agreeing to the demands of the hijackers because eventually we released three dreaded terrorists from Indian custody. This paved the way for the establishment of Jaish e Mohammed, a notorious terrorist outfit which continues to bother India with repeated attacks against India. And finally, we'll also discuss what policy and legal measures have been taken in order to counter such hijacking situations. We will discuss the anti-hijacking policy of 2005 brought out by the Manmohan Singh government and we'll also discuss the anti-hijacking act that was enacted by the Modi government in 2016. So these are the interesting topics that we have lined up for today. But before we start, we have a very important announcement. On April 7th, we shall be conducting a scholarship test to ensure that our courses are affordable for all the aspirants. Unacademy Civil Services Championship test will be conducted and you can attempt UPSC standard question paper and you stand to win 90% scholarship on our IAS courses along with several attractive rewards. So those interested, you can register by using the link provided in the video description and you can even contact us at the number provided over here. So with this, let's begin with the discussion by first understanding which terrorist outfit was responsible for hijacking IC814. So this Indian Airlines flight was essentially coming from Kathmandu to New Delhi. It was a regular scheduled flight of hardly one hour, 30 minutes. 
and this aircraft was hijacked by a Pakistani terrorist outfit known as Harkatul Mujahideen, also abbreviated as HUM. Previously, it was also called Harkat ul Ansar. If you look at its history, if you trace the origin of this terrorist outfit, it was born in the 1980s. Its parent organization was established in the 1980s in the Af Park region. As you know, the Af Park border areas is a hub of radical extremist outfits, which are nurtured by the Pakistani state, including the ISI and the Pakistani army. So this terror outfit was established primarily to counter the Soviet forces which had occupied Afghanistan in 1980s. In the year 1979, Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan and the United States used this opportunity to target the Soviet forces by working with Pakistan to sponsor the creation of Afghan Mujahideen. The local Pashtun elements in Afghanistan were radicalized, trained and armed by US and Pakistan to create the Afghan Mujahideen which, which would resist the Soviet invasion. So some of the Mujahideen elements along with a few radicals from Pakistan with the backing of the ISI and the Pakistani army established another terrorist outfit called Harkatul Ansar. This outfit, after focusing on Afghanistan, it shifted its attention towards Kashmir in 1990s. Because by 1989, the Soviet forces had been defeated. The Mujahideen had won the war in Afghanistan. And as Soviet Union retreated from Afghanistan, Harkatul Ansar started focusing on Kashmir at the behest of Pakistan's deep state. So in Kashmir, it was responsible for various terrorist attacks. And one of its top leaders, the general secretary of this terror outfit, whom you can see in this image over here, Masood Azhar, was captured by Indian forces when he was operating in Kashmir. Along with Masood Azhar, some of the top leaders of this terrorist outfit who were operating in Kashmir Valley, they were arrested by Indian forces following an intelligence-based operation. So these top terrorists of Harkatul Ansar were in Indian custody. They were in Indian jail. So this terrorist outfit later would rebrand itself as Harkatul Mujahideen as it came under sanctions from several countries. From US to Bahrain to India and many other countries, they designated this terror outfit as a, as a noted terrorist organization. And to escape the impact of the sanctions, it rebranded itself as Harkatul Mujahideen. And this terror outfit planned many attempts to secure the release of its leaders. In fact, in 1995, in Kashmir, Western citizens from US and Britain were kidnapped by a terrorist outfit. Eventually, they were all assassinated as well. And this attempt, it was an attempt to get the release of Masood Azhar and other top leaders of this terrorist outfit. Essentially, they were planning to take hostages and use them as leverage to secure the release of their leaders. So many previous attempts have been made in the mid-90s and late 90s, but all these attempts of the terror outfit had failed to secure the release of Masood Azhar. But finally, in 1999, the terror outfit succeeded with the hijacking of IC-814. The prime motive was to secure the release of Masood Azhar, one of the top leaders of Harkatul Mujahideen, and along with him, they wanted to get another few terrorists who were in Indian custody to be released so that they could continue their war against India. So it was primarily Harkatul Mujahideen which was linked with Pakistani agencies, state agencies that was involved in the hijacking. So this clearly points fingers towards Pakistan and the involvement of its deep state in waging a covert proxy war against India. In fact, since 1960s, Pakistan has been involved in using non-state actors to wage this terrorist war against India. First, in the Northeast sector, Pakistan was involved in sponsoring few Northeast insurgent outfits, such as the Mizo National Front. And it would go on to sponsor several other insurgent groups, including Ulfa, NSC, and the Bodo outfits, etc., to destabilize the Northeast region of India. This support was primarily extended via East Pakistan. That is, before Bangladesh was liberated in the 1960s, 
Pakistan was involved in backing some of the Northeast insurgent groups. And even after Bangladesh was created, when a pro-Pakistan government came up in Bangladesh from 1975, Pakistan continued backing Northeast insurgent groups against India. Then as the Khalistan movement rose to prominence in late 70s and 1980s, Pakistan's deep state was directly involved in funding and sponsoring the Khalistan terror groups against India. And as trouble started in Kashmir in 1987, as the separatist insurgent movement broke out in 1987, Pakistan was directly involved in supporting several anti-India terrorist outfits that exclusively focused on Kashmir. So be it Hezbul Mujahideen or lashkar e toiba harkat ul mujahideen and even JKLF, Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front and later the jaish e mohammed Several such terrorist organizations have been backed by Pakistani deep state as part of its covert proxy war against India. So this is a classic case of state-sponsored terrorism against India. Now another important point that we should observe before we proceed with our discussion is how Nepal had conveniently become a safe haven for Pakistan-backed terror groups, particularly in 1980s and 1990s. During this period, Nepal had been exploited by Pakistan's intelligence agency to infiltrate terrorists into India. It had become a preferred infiltration route because India and Nepal have an open border system as part of our close relationship which was established through the 1950 treaty of uh, peace and friendship india nepal set up an open border without security measures or immigration checks or hard border controls because of the relaxed border restrictions this border route has been blatantly misused by pakistan to not just infiltrate terrorists into india but even to enable organized crime into india from smuggling fake Indian currency notes to pump FICNs into India to destabilize the Indian economy to even smuggle arms and drugs and even to infiltrate and exfiltrate terrorists and ISI operatives. The Nepal-India route was largely misused by Pakistan and that is exactly what was responsible for IC814 hijacking. In 1990s, few local elements in Nepal had been backing Pakistan's ISI, creating a support network, which enabled Harkatul Mujahideen to create a base and plan and execute this hijacking in 1999. So at the Tribhuvan International Airport in Kathmandu, these terrorists got free access. They managed to conceal few rudimentary weapons. They boarded the flight and eventually hijacked the flight once it was airborne. So this hijacking incident really shook the country and it was one of the lo longest hijacking incidents because the incident dragged for seven to eight days from 24 December till uh, the 1st of Jan. Throughout that week, India was gripped by this event which was unfolding live on television. So first let's examine the sequence of events as well because it's important to be aware of the key events that transpired during the hijacking crisis. Based on that, we can assess and analyze how the situation was handled by the Vajpayee government. So as the aircraft took off from Kathmandu, from Tribhuvan International Airport, the hijackers who were already on board as passengers, they hijacked the aircraft as it crossed into Indian airspace. They forced the flight to move towards Pakistan, to fly towards Pakistan. This flight was carrying more than 180 people, including passengers and crew. And the hijackers forced the pilot to fly westwards towards Pakistan. The intended route was towards Delhi. As I mentioned, it was a short flight and it was carrying only a limited amount of fuel which was necessary to complete this short duration flight. But now the hijackers were pushing the flight beyond its fuel capacity. So the pilot who was, who applied his presence of mind, he managed to land the aircraft for a short time, for, for a brief time at Amritsar by citing that the flight was running out of fuel. The flight was indeed running out of fuel but it could have made an entry into Pakistan, but Pakistan also, on the other hand, had shut off the airspace to not allow the hijacked aircraft into its territory. 
because Pakistan was concerned and worried that India would definitely blame Pakistan for the hijacking. Recently, just before the hijacking, uh, tensions were very high between the two countries. The nuclear tests had happened, uh, the Kargil conflict had taken place. So during this period of heightened tensions, Pakistan didn't want uh, any unnecessary attention. So it tried blocking the airspace, preventing the entry of the aircraft. And the pilot as well used his presence of mind to land for a few hours at Amritsar. Now this was the golden opportunity for India. Probably the only opportunity for India. After almost one hour of the hijacking, the government was informed about the incident. A crisis management group was immediately constituted and it met on an urgent basis which included top officials and top leaders of the government. Ideally, in such a situation, there is a standard operating protocol. There is a standard operating protocol which is initiated and the first goal is to immobilize the aircraft because to ensure that the aircraft doesn't take off again and ensure that the aircraft remains within our jurisdiction, within our territory, within our airspace, it is crucial to disable or immobilize the aircraft. Usually what is done as a standard practice is that either the aircraft tires are shot or the runway is disrupted by spraying oil on it or by placing uh, vehicles so that it doesn't take off again. Right? So many such measures are available through which the aircraft can be immobilized or at least you can ensure it doesn't take off again. But due to the indecisiveness of the crisis management group under the Vajpayee administration, precious time was lost. We will discuss this in slight detail as to what exactly happened. It's a great lesson in decision making as well. Right? That too during crisis times. It's very difficult to take these hard decisions. But there are no excuses when it comes to these situations. So due to the slowed, slowdown in decision making and the indecisiveness on the part of the government, the aircraft took off. The hijackers forced the pilot after a long delay. They started panicking that India might be planning a commando raid and they pushed the pilot to take off again. And this time, the pilot had to head towards Pakistan. There was no other choice. So aircraft was running low on fuel and Pakistani authorities who realized that the aircraft might crash, they briefly allowed the aircraft to land at Lahore. So after landing at Lahore, the aircraft was refueled and according to Indian intelligence reports, arms and weapons were transferred as well. There was a similar incident that had happened in 1980s when a few Khalistani terrorists had hijacked an Indian aircraft. They had taken it to Dubai back then. Briefly, they had stopped in Pakistan. But those hijackers didn't even have basic weapons when they hijacked the aircraft. But after landing in Pakistan, they had weapons in their hands. And eyewitnesses and intelligence reports indicated that most likely Pakistan had passed on weapons after it landed in Pakistan. Something similar happened again in 1999. More weapons were handed over, most likely in Lahore, and Pakistan forced the aircraft to take off again. But however, for India, the opportunity was already lost. The moment the aircraft left Indian airspace, any possible military intervention or a commando raid was impossible after this. No country would tolerate a special forces operation on their soil by foreign troops. Even a friendly country would never allow foreign troops on their soil to conduct any such uh, commando raid or a, or a military special operation. So from here, the hijacked aircraft was taken to Dubai in United Arab Emirates. Immediately, the Indian diplomats, the Indian ambassador and consul general in uh, Dubai, they rushed to the airfield trying to influence the UAE government, pressurize the UAE government to allow India either to conduct a military raid or at least to defuse the situation right here in Dubai. But UAE refused to cooperate. India reached out to the United States as well, hoping for some diplomatic assistance from the US. But US also refused to help India, given the complicated relations that we had. The UAE also firmly denied any possibility of a NSG commando raid on the aircraft on their soil. So with all the options lost, India managed to secure the release of some hostages at least in Dubai. The UAE authorities opened a channel with the hijackers and few hostages, few women and children, and one injured passenger who had been stabbed, who eventually lost his life. They were released and the hijacked aircraft took off again. By the way, this was the only casualty in the incident. 
only one passenger lost his life unfortunately right he was released here in dubai after being stabbed and eventually unfortunately he lost his life so from here there were still around 150 160 passengers on board and the hijackers took the aircraft towards afghanistan now this was an absolute nightmare for india it was the worst case scenario for india the aircraft leaving indian airspace itself was a worst case scenario but now it was headed towards a country with whom we did not have any kind of diplomatic relations they were taking the aircraft to a country where there was an extremist group in power the taliban the taliban had already established its regime in 1996 after toppling the previous afghan government the taliban and india had no diplomatic relations india treated taliban as a terrorist organization given its links with pakistan and other anti india terrorist groups pakistan's isi the pakistani army establishment and many anti india terror outfits like lashkar and others they were very close to taliban so taliban was sheltering anti india terror outfits it had forced the indian embassy to be shut down as well when it took over the country it had thrown out indian diplomats in 1996 so we had no contact no relations with taliban regime and we had designated taliban as a terrorist outfit so this was an absolute nightmare for the vajpay government and indeed a very difficult and challenging situation for any government and any leader to handle so this is where we will carry out an analysis of the decision making process based on verifiable records and by using established concepts of decision making let us see where the vajpay administration went wrong see first let's understand what is this crisis management group that was constituted the crisis management group set up under prime minister vajpay it would consist of top officials and ministers to handle the situation that had developed it was chaired by the cabinet secretary the then cabinet secretary prabhat kumar cabinet secretary of india is the highest ranking civil servant so under the chairmanship of cabinet secretary under the monitor, uh, under the observation of prime minister vajpay the cmg was established it also included the then chief of raw india's foreign intelligence agency as dulat it also included the director general of nsg the national security guards or the black cat commandos which is a elite special force unit that specializes in counter terrorist and anti hijack operations in fact nsg has a dedicated unit called 52 sag or 52 special action group which specializes in anti hijack operations it was this nsg unit which had been mobilized following the hijacking but unfortunately it, this unit could not be airlifted to amritsar precious time was lost and by the time nsg commandos arrived in amritsar the hijackers had already taken off with the aircraft so the director general of nsg nikhil kumar was part of the cmg along with then home minister and deputy pm lk adwani and foreign minister jaswant singh it also included india's first national security advisor brajesh mishra Rajesh Mishra as the NSA would be advising the PM on all security and foreign policy matters. So this was the composition of the crisis management group. Now this is where a few blunders were committed in decision making during the critical hours. See first of all there was a very big delay in informing Prime Minister Vajpayee after the hijacking had occurred. as soon as the hijacking had taken place the pilot had communicated this to the atc from there the government authorities got the information and cmg and the top officials were aware of the incident and it took several more minutes to brief the prime minister about the hijacking so this was a very precious time of around 90 to 100 minutes now how do we know all these details we know these details because as dulat himself who was part of the cmg has written a book in which he brings out all the details so a precious 100 minutes was lost before the prime minister was even informed the cmg met around 5:30 to 6 pm the cmg got to know about the incident around 5:30 by 6 pm the cmg was meeting in new delhi at raisina hill but by then almost 1 and 1/2 to 2 hours of time had been lost and by then the aircraft had landed in amritsar as well and the punjab police requested permission to conduct a commando raid on their own because see the problem with nsg was that 
it was very centralized. NSG was based only out of Manesar on the outskirts of Delhi in Haryana, right? That is the NSG hub. Now we have decentralized it after the Mumbai attacks, after 2611 attacks. But back then, NSG was headquartered only in Manesar. By the time they could reach the Palam airport in Delhi and by the time they could be airlifted from there, that would take a precious one or two hours. So precious time would be lost again. So as the CMG was still waiting to take a call, it was still being very indecisive. There was infighting going on within the CMG as well. The Punjab police did not get the approval to hit the aircraft. The Punjab police had a set of special uh, T, uh, special force commandos. Since Punjab had dealt with Khalistan movement and several hijacking incidents, it had raised a special force unit comprising of elite commandos who could have potentially carried out the intervention. But they had no specialization in anti-hijack operations. So if not authorizing a raid on the aircraft, at least the aircraft should have been immobilized. The runway should have been disabled to ensure that the hijackers don't take off again. So this critical decision was not taken by the CMG. According to A.S. Dulat, who writes in his book, there was infighting within the CMG where one agency was blaming the other for the incident between RAW and other intelligence agencies and also with NSG and cabinet secretary. There was a blame game which was taking place that led to precious loss of time. And as public and media pressure started building up, the prime minister came under tremendous pressure leading to a faulty decision being made. The decision was NSG would carry out the intervention. The problem here was that yes, NSG was the right call because the 52 SAC specializes in anti-hijack operations. Punjab police commandos may not have been effective. It, things could have gotten even worse, leading to the loss of lives of hostages. But at least Punjab police should have been given a direction to immobilize the aircraft and disable the runway. There was a lot of red tapeism. Airport authorities had to ask permissions. State government had to reach out to the center. By the time these informations, these decisions were relayed, precious time had already been lost. So eventually, NSG commandos did arrive, but they came almost one hour after the aircraft had already left. The hijackers started panicking after a couple of hours, right? And they forced the pilot to take off and head towards Pakistan. So now here we can apply a certain model, a decision-making model to understand why this crisis hit the CMG. It's referred to as the bounded rationality model or the bounded rationality trap. See, this is a theory in decision making. It applies in political science, uh, in uh, administration, in economics and investments, right? You can apply this in several domains. The bounded ras rationality model says that even rational individuals who can take rational decisions, they are not able to take the right decision when they don't have all the information with them. When there is limited knowledge about a certain event, when there is a constraint on the information available, on the data available, when there is a limited cognitive capacity, and when there is a time limit under stress, these individuals, they will take the most convenient decision instead of taking the best possible decision. So instead of taking the most optimal decision, which is in the best interest of let's say the nation in case of foreign policy and security issues, these individuals who are actually rational individuals, they will end up taking a satisfactory decision, which will satisfy everyone, right? So they will not be able to conduct a cost benefit analysis. They'll not be able to look at the long term consequences and impact because they have limited information. The cognitive capabilities are limited under high stress, high pressure situations. Plus, Time is ticking, every second, every minute is critical. And in such a high pressure environment, when there is limitation on information available, limitation on the cognitive capabilities as well, these rational individuals take the most satisfactory choice, which will please everyone. And this may not be the best decision. It may not be the best optimal choice. This is what bounded rationality model says about decision making in high pressure situations. And according to A.S. Dulat and several experts, that is exactly what happened. Two important pieces of information was left out, was never considered by the crisis management group. Several journalists who have gone into the details of this incident 
right, and experts who have analyzed the events, they've all agreed that two vital pieces of information was left out. No thought was given to these vital pieces of information while taking the decision to hold the Punjab police. One information was the CMG never factored, never in their wildest dream, they imagined the aircraft taking off again. They assumed that the aircraft is low on fuel and it will stay in Amritsar. Not for a second, they considered the possibility that hijackers might push the pilot to take off and it might leave Indian airspace as well. Given how close Amritsar is uh, to the Pakistani border, this should have been factored in. In those critical moments, this vital information was left out, leading to the initiation of the bounded rationality model. Rationality got bounded by this limitation on knowledge, limitation on information. Second, they did not account for the reserve fuel the aircraft would have, which would allow the aircraft to at least fl fly for a few more miles before it could land or even crash. These two in pieces of information was not even considered by the crisis management group. Ideally, it should have been done. If this awareness was there, most likely they would have taken a better decision, which was to immobilize the aircraft at any cost and disable the runway at any cost. Wait for until NSG can arrive. It was a right call that Punjab com police commandos won't be able to execute a successful operation. That was absolutely right. But the lack of consideration about the aircraft taking off again is the biggest criticism against the Vajpayee government. This should have been factored in by the then officials and leaders who are part of the CMG. They should have authorized the Punjab police commandos to immobilize the aircraft, shoot the tires or disable the runway and ensure it doesn't take off again. And within an hour, NSG commandos would have arrived. They would have mounted an anti-hijack operation. It would have been a risky operation, but at least we wouldn't have paid a bigger price, a long-term price. So A.S. Dulat, after retirement, writes in his book, Kashmir. It's a beautiful book about the Vajpayee years. So as the then raw chief, he talks about several critical decisions related to India, Pakistan and Kashmir. And one incident he focuses upon is IC-814 hijacking. So there he himself admits that CMG goofed up in Amritsar. Essentially, the top officials and leaders made a blunder. He himself is critical of what happened. And don't forget, he was part of the CMG. As the former raw chief, he was one of the members of the crisis management group. So he points out how there was infighting within CMG. Precious time was lost. Decisions were delayed. There was indecisiveness on the part of the prime minister and the top officials and leaders. So this was the blunder that India committed in Amritsar. This was the mishandling of the entire situation. Because once the aircraft left India, things went out of hand. That was the worst possible scenario for India. There was nothing else India could have done apart from talking to the terrorists and agreeing to their demands. Now let's examine where we stood on Taliban. What was the situation when the aircraft landed in Kandahar? Did we have any other options? See, when... The hijackers took the aircraft to Dubai and landed here in Dubai. India did explore the option of sending NSG to Dubai. India reached out to UAE authorities asking permission for a military raid, for a commando operation. But obviously, UAE denied it. Back then, India and UAE were not very close. Today, our relations have transformed completely. After 2010, India-UAE relations has completely transformed. It's one of our closest strategic partners today. But back then, that, is, that wasn't the case. The UAE refused any such permission for an Indian operation on their soil. The Americans refused to step in or refu they refused to put any kind of diplomatic pressure on UAE. So all the options were closed for India. So once the aircraft landed in Kandahar, this was an absolute nightmare for Indian authorities because we had no connection, no contact with the Taliban regime. As we were discussing, in 1996, Taliban had taken over the country and India had cut off all diplomatic ties. We had shut down the embassy, our diplomats had been thrown out. India had designated Taliban as a terrorist group because it was close to Pakistan's intelligence agency and the army. It was seen as a puppet of Pakistan's ISI. It was seen to be sheltering anti-India terrorist groups. Apart from sheltering Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, the Taliban regime had sheltered 
other anti-India terror groups as well, including Hizbul Mujahideen, Lashkar-e Toiba, and the others. So India had correctly designated Taliban as a terrorist regime, and we had no relations or no contacts with Taliban. So after the aircraft landed here, the Taliban fighters surrounded the aircraft. You can see the image here. This image evokes a trauma for Indians, right, who witnessed uh, that incident live on television back in that era. So Indian passengers and crew were trapped for seven to eight days and India had only one option to talk, to negotiate with the terrorists. So immediately, a team of negotiators were assembled by the Indian government, by Vajpayee's administration. The negotiators included current National Security Advisor, Ajit Doval, who would later go on to become the Director of Intelligence Bureau. Another top intelligence official, Nenchal Sandhu, who would again go on to become a Director of IB. So, uh, apart from him, there was C.D. Sahai, who would later become the Raw Chief, Vikram Sood as well, who, was, who later became the Chief of Raw. So these top intelligence officials were dispatched under the leadership of Vivek Kadju, to India's top diplomat. Vivek Kadju was an IFS officer. The rest were IPS officers. Right? The other four were career intelligence officers from IB and RAW. And Vivek Kadju, right, he was heading the India, pa uh, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan division in the Ministry of External Affairs as a joint secretary. So this was the negotiating team along with few other officials who were dispatched to Kandahar to directly open negotiations with the hijackers. Now these hijackers raised a big demand. Initially, they demanded... Uh, a ransom as well. They demanded some money to be paid, a few million dollars. And along with that, they gave a list of terrorists in Indian custody whom they wanted to be released by India. Now, this was unacceptable to India initially. But by then, in India, public pressure was building up. Every day, there were live visuals of the hijacking incident being relayed. The family members of uh, the victims, right, they started pressurizing the government. They even barged a press conference held by Jaswan Singh the then foreign minister, and brought tremendous pressure on the government of India. So now things had really gotten out of hand. There was no question of India considering any other option. A commando raid was out of the picture. Any kind of military action was out of the picture, given that Taliban was hostile. And moreover, Pakistan would have never, never given access to reach Afghanistan. We could have considered reaching Afghanistan via Iran or Central Asia. But again, it was not viable. It would have taken a lot of time, plus the operation itself would have been extremely risky with no guarantee for safety of hostages. So given the situation, the only option was to talk, negotiate and agree for a hostage swap. Finally, the negotiators did a fine job. They managed to bring down the list to a minimum acceptable number. Hijackers wanted three dreaded terrorists to be released eventually. They dropped the ransom demand as well. Taliban was acting as a mediator here. Taliban officials were mediating between Indian negotiators and the hijackers. And the demand was primarily focused on Masood Azhar. As I told you, this was their main motive. The primary motive of the hijacking was to get the release of Masood Azhar. And apart from that, they wanted two other direct terrorists to be released. One was Omar Sheikh. You can see him in the image here. And the third was Mushtaq Zargar. So India agreed to the demand. We agreed for this ransom. Not in terms of money, but a bigger price was paid actually. Right? Three dreaded terrorists who were in Indian custody were released by India. And this picture tells the entire story. Foreign Minister Jaswan Singh had to personally accompany these terrorists and hand them over to the hijackers. Essentially, Taliban fighters received them. And the Taliban fled away with the terrorists whom we had released along with the hijackers and India got back the hostages safely and they were flown back to India. Of course, hostages and their lives were saved apart from one passenger who was killed, right? But trust me, on every account, this was a massive failure for India, a huge security setback for India. Because Masood Azhar would later go on to establish one of the most notorious terrorist organizations, jaish e Mohammed. After his release, by 2000, he established jaish e Mohammed with the help of Pakistan's ISI. And as you all know, jaish e Mohammed is single-handedly responsible for some of the biggest terror attacks against India. 
within one year in 2001, it carried out the deadly parliament attacks. It attacked the very temple of Indian democracy and pushed India-Pakistan to the brink of war. Because after parliament attacks, India mobilized its troops under Operation Parakram and was preparing to go to war with Pakistan. Imagine a conflict breaking out between two nuclear armed rivals because of a terror attack carried out by a group which was set up by a terrorist who was released by India from Indian custody. Right? So, even later, Jaisha Mohammed has been responsible for some of the biggest attacks against India. Be it the Patan Court Air Base attacks recently in 2014-2015, the Uri attacks which led India to carry out the surgical strikes and finally the Pulwama attacks of 2019 which again pushed India to resort to military action and carry out uh, Balkot air strikes that led to heightened tensions between India and Pakistan. So on multiple occasions, Jaisya Mohammed has almost pushed India-Pakistan to the brink of war, to the brink of conflict. So that is the heavy price that India has paid for releasing Masood Azhar from custody. The other two terrorists as well, they went on to commit grave acts of, acts of terrorism after India released them. Omar Sheikh is a very interesting character, very interesting individual. He is highly educated. He is a graduate from London School of Economics. Later got radicalized and became a terrorist, operated in Kashmir. He was responsible for the kidnapping of Western nationals in Kashmir uh, with the intention of securing the release of Masood Azhar. So India had apprehended him, captured him. So after India released him following the hijacking, he was considered to be one of the financiers of 9-11 attacks. There is a lot of speculation that Omar Sheikh was one of the financiers who channeled money to the 9-11 hijackers who carried out the attacks against the United States. He was also involved in the kidnapping and beheading of American journalist Daniel Pearl, which was a horrific incident of terrorism in Pakistan. In fact, that is even depicted in a Hollywood movie, uh, A Mighty Heart by Angelina Jolie. Right? In fact, there's a Bollywood movie as well, a biopic on Omar Sheikh by Rajkumar Rao. It's called Omarta. So, Omar Sheikh has been involved in grave acts of terrorism and even though he remains in a Pakistani jail, con he continues to pose a threat to India. He continues to operate from jail and remains an active terrorist. Mushtaq Zargar was a, a Kashmiri separatist. With the backing of Pakistan, he would lead a, a terror war against India Currently, he is believed to be based out of POK, Pakistan Occupied Kashmir, and is actively involved in terrorism in Kashmir. So that is the heavy price that India paid following the release of these terrorists. But the lives of the hostages were saved. So this is where the Vajpayee government faces a lot of criticism from the media, from strategic experts, within the government as well. According to reports, LK Advani himself was extremely upset with the decision that had been taken. Because India had bowed down in front of the terrorists. And this essentially sets a wrong precedent. You set a wrong precedent that tomorrow if you continue such hijacks or if you hold hostages, right? It sends out a wrong message that we are willing to negotiate, we are ready to talk to terrorists and agree to their demands. Negotiating with terrorists is usually considered as, as completely against the ethos of counter-terror operations. Even at the risk of the lives of hostages, sometimes, if you look at the long-term uh, consequences, right? if you take the cost-benefit analysis into account, sometimes it is better to not negotiate with the terrorists. But given the circumstances, the Vajpayee administration was forced to talk, agree to their demands and fulfill every single demand that they wanted. So this is where there was a lot of criticism against uh, the way the Vajpayee administration had handled the crisis. So first, the decisions with regard to the situation in Amritsar. Second, the negotiation that happened in Kandahar and the eventual release of the terrorists. These were the biggest criticisms against Prime Minister Vajpayee and his administration regarding how they handled the crisis. But however, there is a counter argument to this. This counter argument is offered by Jaswan Singh himself. After he stepped away from politics, Jaswan Singh wrote a, a very good book called India at Risk. In this book, Jaswan Singh talks about this incident and he explains the logic behind the decision. He says that the decision to negotiate with the terrorists and release the uh, terrorists, it was based on rational actor model. 
it's another model in decision making especially when dealing with a crisis situation right usually you will have bad choices in front of you right but sometimes you will have to choose the lesser of the two evils you will have to choose the least worst outcome possible that is what rational actors do in such an environment it's called the rational choice theory in decision making it applies for uh, polit uh, political science geopolitics even economics and as well as administration in rational choice theory individuals use rational calculations to make a rational choice a logical choice to achieve an outcome which is aligned with the personal objectives of the individual in this case what was our objective primary objective of india was to secure the lives of all the hostages at any cost this was a top priority jaswan singh says that no government no democratic civilian government could sacrifice the lives of hostages even though sacrificing them appears to be a rational choice it can't be done because no re responsible government can can tolerate even the loss of a innocent civilian imagine more than 160 civilians being killed at the hands of terrorists right this is an understandable argument a very good defense as well of course what happened in amritsar is entirely the fault of the cmg but the negotiation the release of the terrorists eventually we didn't have any other choice it was it was the least of the two evils that india had to choose so uh, jaswan singh says that when we are dealing with national security decisions right decisions can't be categorized into right and wrong it's not a world of black and white these decisions are all based on a shade of gray right it's all a gray area that you operate in especially in the world of national security so jaswan singh justifies that the decision to negotiate with terrorists and release them right in exchange for lives of hostages was a well thought out decision because eventually we managed to save the lives of the hostages so that is a justification offered by jaswan singh based on rational actor model or the rational choice theory is that clear now you let me know in the comments what do you think about the decisions that were taken where did the wajpay government go wrong could we have done better as far as the indian uh, flight was still in indian airspace right when it was still within indian airspace or when it was still in amritsar could india have done something better that is where the biggest criticism lies that was a lost opportunity without doubt that was a mistake on the part of the government but after leaving india after it landed in kandahar that was a difficult choice it's a great qu uh, uh, question as well as far as decision making is concerned let's say in the upsc interview the panel might ask you let's say you are in that situation what what is your call should you save the hostages or should you look at the long term consequences sacrifice the hostages to protect your long term security interests or agree to the demands of the terrorists and get the hostages released and ensure their safety what will you do let me know in the comments what do you think about this difficult situation so following this india did learn several important lessons there was an urgent need to upgrade our standard operating protocols with regard to hijacking incidents see even in 1980s we had dealt with many hijacking situations under indira gandhi and rajiv gandhi governments but those were very minute incidents compared to what happened in 99 few kalistani outfits had committed few hijackings but these were not well trained or well armed terrorists we could deal with the situation manage and contain the situation but what happened in 99 shook india and within 2 years in 2001 a similar incident would take place the 911 attacks when al qaeda hijacked four commercial airliners and used it as missiles and flew them into strategic buildings including the world trade center in new york the pentagon and and another flight crashed in a in a empty field right one of the biggest terror attacks that we have ever witnessed which changed global geopolitics forever so for the first time the world realized that a hijacked plane could be used for such a purpose to strike a strategic building or a nuclear power plant or vital installations which could cause even more significant damage so in such scenarios what do you do do you have the courage to shoot down such an aircraft which has gone rogue where you have a clear indication that the hijackers are going to fly the aircraft like a missile let's say uh, into the parliament or into a nuclear power plant into a strategic building do you sit and wait or do you order the shoot down of the aircraft 
So that is the challenge and question India also dealt with after uh, these two incidents, after IC814 and 9-11 attacks. So in 2005, the Manmohan Singh government came out with an anti-hijacking policy. According to the policy, which was approved by Cabinet Committee on Security, which is headed by the Prime Minister, right? it includes other top cabinet ministers like the Home Minister, Defence Minister, and also for External Affairs and Finance Minister. This is the composition of Cabinet Committee on Security. So CCS, headed by the PM, approved this policy, and according to the policy, any such hijacking will be seen as an act of aggression, an act of war against the Indian state. And accordingly, steps will be taken. The standard operating protocol has been laid down. It's very clear that India will henceforth not negotiate with the terrorists. No negotiation according to the policy. Negotiations will be used only as a tactic, only for tactical purposes to buy time. Professional negotiators right, will play the psychological game with the hijackers to just buy time to delay so that we get enough time to plan, prepare and carry out a military raid, a commando raid. So negotiations are ruled out. The policy says that demands of hijackers will not be met at any cost. Either we will conduct a commando raid or we will explore other military options. No negotiation with the terrorists. Negotiations will only be for tactical purposes to buy time. And the red tapism has been removed. The decision making has been uh, fastened or speeded up because of the new protocol in place. If a aircraft is hijacked, the concerned airport authorities have the power right now to disable the aircraft and even to immobilize the runway. They don't have to wait and ask for permissions from state government officials or central government officials or security agencies. At the airport level, by using the local resources available, the runway can be disabled by the authorities, they don't have to wait for any approval or permission and they can disable the aircraft as well if possible. Let's say the local police or the CISF, right, and the airport management authorities, they can work together and take a call to disable the runway and even disable, immobilize the aircraft to ensure it doesn't take off. All right, so essentially a delegation of power has been done. And more importantly, Indian Air Force has been given a pivotal role in such hijacking incidents. Indian Air Force will immediately scramble fighter jets to escort the aircraft, ensure it remains in Indian airspace, ensure it does not leave India at any cost and force the hijackers to land in a nearby Indian airport. And this is where, if there is an assessment that the aircraft is going rogue, aircraft, aircraft is becoming a threat, let's say it's deviating from its aligned path, it's headed towards a vital uh, buildings and installations like a nuclear plant or uh, let's say towards the Prime Minister's office or towards the Parliament, right? In such scenarios, the Indian Air Force will have the right to shoot down the aircraft. The decision will have to come from the Cabinet Committee on Security headed by the Prime Minister. The PM will have to take a call and authorize the Indian Air Force to shoot down the aircraft if, if there is an assessment that the aircraft has gone completely rogue, that hijackers are trying to replicate a 9-11 attack if they are trying to use it as a missile to fl fly it into a key building, there will be more loss of lives. Either ways, hostages are lost, right? If the aircraft is crashed, either ways, hostages are going to die. So in such a scenario, you will be forced to take this hard decision and it's left to the Indian Air Force to execute and it's left to the Prime Minister to order the strike. That is what the anti-hijacking policy of India says. Then, an anti-hijacking act was also enacted by the Indian Parliament in 2016. This has widened the definition of hijacking and it is in line with the global conventions to which India is a party to. We have the Hague Hijacking Convention. India is a signatory to it and we have ratified it. And also the 2010 Beijing uh, Protocol, supplementary to the convention. So India has adopted these international standards to prosecute hijacking incidents. And accordingly, the old Anti-Hijacking Act of 1982 was repealed and replaced with the new law. So the new law has widened the definition of hijacking. It covers all forms of hijacking, including any forceful seizure of an aircraft which is in service, all right? Any takeover of an aircraft through coercion, through threat, or even through technological methods. Hijackers may not be physically present. What if through, 
let's say a cyber attack, if they are able to disable and take over an aircraft, even that is accounted for under the new law. Regular hijacking, your conventional methods of hijacking, where threat, force and coercion is used, where hijackers are physically present on the aircraft, or even where through technological means, usually it's a reference to cyber attacks, right? If virtually if someone takes over the aircraft and disables it or hijacks it, right? And even if hijacker is not present there physically, all those incidents are defined and covered under hijacking uh, provisions of the Anti-Hijacking Act. It provides for very stringent punishment, including death penalty and a life sentence. Hijackers, even an attempted hijacking, even a hoax call could lead to a life sentence. And if there is a death of the passenger or the crew, then death sentence is also delivered. Death penalty can also be delivered. And the jurisdiction also has been expanded. If the aircraft has left India, or let's say it's a foreign registered aircraft, but Indian passengers are there in it, right? Even if the incident takes place in foreign territory, foreign jurisdiction, India will still exercise the right to investigate and prosecute this incident under this law. So these provisions were specifically added after the 1999 Kandahar hijacking. We also have included the possibility of extradition. Hijacking has been made an extraditable offense. So if another country wants a set of hijackers who hijacked a plane in India, we are willing to extradite them to the concerned country. Similarly, the other countries are also obligated under the extradition treaties that we have signed with them. If there is a certain hijacking which has happened in a foreign country, right, or involving a foreign aircraft where Indian passengers are involved, right, and if India presses for the extradition of those hijackers, those countries should also be honoring the commitment to extradite them and hand them over to India so they could face the punishment in Indian custody. So all these provisions have been added to the Anti-Hijacking Act following the lessons that we have learned from Kandahar hijacking. So on this note, I would like to conclude the session for today. I hope you guys have understood everything, you have liked the session. Do let me know in the, what you think in the comments. And before we close the session, please take up a practice question. The Cabinet Committee on Security is chaired by the President, Prime Minister, Cabinet Secretary or National Security Advisor. Let me know the answer in the comments and also take up these two questions for your answer writing practice. It's all related to what we have studied today. It's based on the anti-hijack policy and the anti-hijacking act and a question on the challenges posed by a hijacked aircraft. Such questions can be anticipated, especially in internal security under GS paper 3. Under international relations, a specific question related to Pakistan-sponsored terrorism, right? So in such a question, you can cover this incident, mention this in your answers. So please write an answer to the questions given and post the answers in the comment section below. So that is it for today. Join me again on Saturday at 7 p.m. for one last session under India's biggest foreign policy controversies. And also before I end, tomorrow we have an important strategy session at 8 p.m. live on our YouTube channel. And Sarmad Mehrat sir will be providing you complete guidance to crack the IAS exam. So do attend this session as well tomorrow at 8 p.m. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching.